21st, 2006, Colm Kelleher on Banal of America Audio. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to another edition of Banal of America Audio. My guest this week is Colm Kelleher. He is the co-author of Hunt for the Skinwalker about the Nids Ranch in Utah, and he was the project manager and team leader at a private research institute at uh, National Institute of Discovery Sciences, which is NIDS. And uh, he's also well-known in esoteric circles for his Mad Cow and CJD research and the book Brain Trust. And he has a PhD in biochemistry, and he is the guest this week on Been All of America Audio. Welcome to the show, Colm. Great to be here, Tim. Uh, why don't you just give me a little brief bio on how, uh, you, how you ended up at NIDS. Well, my background, as you mentioned, is in biochemistry. I was working in uh, a institute in immunology in Denver, Colorado, in 1996 when I saw what I thought was a very interesting ad for research managers in a new institute um, that was published in Science Magazine, which is the prim one of the premier uh, science journals. And the ad was specifically looking for people who were willing to research the origin and evolution of consciousness in the universe. Now, how often do you see an ad like that in science magazines? So obviously I was intrigued enough to uh, answer the ad. At the same time, as an immunologist, um, I've always been interested in the effects on the immune system of altered states and uh, different different stress levels on the immune system as well as, uh, as physiology in general. So when, uh, when I heard about this, this uh, new organization called the National Institute for Discovery Science, um, obviously I applied and uh, I was successful. So I moved from Denver to Las Vegas in uh, 1996 to begin working as a research manager at the National Institute for Discovery Science. And it is. It, it was a very, very unusual organization in that it was specifically formed in order to study the quote-unquote uh, paranormal or anomalies, which included UFO sightings, uh, cattle mutilations, and and you know the usual cast of characters in, in paranormal phenomena. And what was different about NIS was that it was fully funded by. Uh, Robert Bigelow, who is the CEO of an aerospace company and also a real estate entrepreneur in Las Vegas. So he hired a bunch of professional scientists as well as uh, a science advisory board, which had a lot of uh, expertise in different topics, including physics, chemistry, biology. There were medical people on board. There was psychology people, computer science experts, and forensics, and all of these oh, wow. people were mainstream scientists who worked in government labs and academia. So National Institute for Discovery Science had both full-time scientists on its staff as well as a very um, well-qualified science advisory board. So it was not the kind of usual investigation of paranormal phenomena that people talk about. In other words, people are doing it on their own time on weekends or, or you know, during the evenings kind yeah. of thing. So it, you know, from that perspective, I think the, the NIDF was a very unique organization. Now, how long were you working for NIDS before they uh, picked up the Gorman Ranch? Uh, it was very quick, actually, because um, the Gorman Ranch began to sort of filter out into the into the media in summer of '96. I joined in uh, August of '96, so there was a very short period um, between joining and actually. Um, getting involved on the ranch. My first trip to the ranch was in September 96, so oh, wow. um, it was very fast, actually. Okay, and yeah, let me uh, just do a little background here on the book, because the book is about the ranch, the infamous Nids Ranch, uh, that many in Esoterica have heard about and talked about for so long, and finally the book has come out. Uh, it's one of the most talked about books of the holiday season, and now uh, everybody, I hope, has either picked it up and read it, or is it going out and getting it after this interview, or is it going to shut off the interview and buy it and read it and then listen to the interview? But it's definitely, you got to check out this book. It was awesome. I loved it. And it's about this ranch. First, this family moves there. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff happens. Giant wolves, uh, UFOs, Bigfoot-type sighting things, just uh, poltergeist-type activity, crazy stuff. They eventually can't take any more. They move out. The NIDS, uh, the National Institute for Discovery Science, buys the ranch and they install uh, these fine folks, these scientists of whom Colm was one of. Is that pretty much the, the gist of the story? 
Yeah, that's that's correct. The family, I think, we're we're at the stage of mental and physical exhaustion um, by the summer of 1996, and uh, so they started reaching out for help, and um, word got out um, into the media, and uh, we heard about it in uh, July or so of 1996. Now, at this stage, the family had been on the property for about 20 months, which is a very short time, but during that period, um, out of a herd of 80 cattle, which was their livelihood, they, they bred uh, high-end cattle, like yeah. black simmentals, black angus. Out of a herd of 80 cattle, they had either lost, disappeared, or, or had been killed 14 animals. So oh, man. No, a normal attrition rate for this kind of an operation was one animal per year. But uh, 14 animals had disappeared or, or been killed in 20 months, and they were they were essentially economically bankrupt. At the same time, they had been exposed to almost daily or weekly um, extremely stressful events that they could not explain. This was a salt of the earth family who were were basically looking to set up a, a ranching operation in a quiet area of northeastern Utah, and they they just wanted to get about their business, but they were constantly besieged by phenomena they could not explain um, to the extent that they lost sleep. The kids uh, in school, um, their grades fell from straight A students all the way down to D's and um, they just couldn't sleep. So by the time we actually took over the property, they were all sleeping in the same living room in this small property um, on the floor just for, for protection, basically, it, oh, in numbers. They were so traumatized by what had happened. They hadn't had a decent night's sleep in a uh, couple of months. So they were ready to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible. And, and when NIDS um, saw the potential, um, we instantly purchased the ranch and set it up as an experimental laboratory in the paranormal. Now, in the story, uh, you guys are investigating stuff, and often you say it, it wasn't enough to bring to the science board. Do you, you follow me? Like the uh, yeah. Now, what? Like, explain to me this sort of how that was set up. Like, they were they were they kept sort of out of the loop, but they didn't go there and check it out too. It's sort of like you would bring what you guys found to them, and then they could, but it wasn't ever enough. Well, the the, um, the science advisory board. Uh, some of the members actually visited the property on a number of occasions. But they, there were 15 to 16 people on the board. They were all working in different parts of the country. They were extremely busy in their mainstream jobs. They worked in either um, research laboratories, uh, universities, or government laboratories. So they had, you know, very busy day jobs. So every couple of months, they would be flown to Las Vegas for a series of briefings oh, wow. from the, uh, the, the the NID staff who would spend all the time on the property. Uh, we would compile all of the data that we had come up with, including any photographs, any uh, tracings, uh, magnetic field tracings, any any videotape, and uh, we would we would essentially go into these exhaustive briefings over a several day period. And the science advisory board were looking for um, evidence that was deemed acceptable in mainstream science, and and you know they were they were pretty strict about adhering to uh, scientific protocols. So. Um, all of the evidence that was collected, uh, certainly in the initial stages, were, were basically eyewitness testimony from uh, NIDS researchers who were on the property. They saw weird stuff. A lot of the stuff that we saw was very transient. It was difficult to capture on film because it was there one moment and then it was gone the next. Yeah. Um, it rarely reappeared in, in exactly the same spot. So, you know, setting up cameras, we, which we did in, in a particular area, sometimes didn't yield the kind of results that the Science Advisory Board was looking for. Um, but in general, they were extremely supportive. I mean, they, oh, some good. of them actually became mentors to the, the project, and they were in uh, touch by either telephone or by email practically every week. So it was not sort of like this this group of scientists who were sort of removed from the whole project. They were extremely well aware of what was going on on a weekly basis, but they they were flown to Las Vegas every couple of months and, and given these extended briefings that lasted over a few days. And now you know about how uh, the how the paranormal, so there's a stigma attached to it, to uh, studying it. Was, were the scientists on the science board and you guys at the ranch and stuff, was it sort of kept on the down low with these guys so it wouldn't hurt their reputation, or, or was it pretty well known that they were part of the NIDS board? 
Uh, some of them um, did agree to uh, to release their names publicly and their association with NIDS, but quite a few of them uh, refused because for exactly the, the 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 reasons you've given. And to this to this day, there are several members of the science, NID Science Advisory Board whose names have never been made made public, and that is because some of them were extremely well known in their own uh, fields of science and. Uh, they, their reputations would be tainted by association with, uh, with, with this kind of a study. No matter how rigorous and no matter how scientific yeah. uh, the study was, the fact is that, that it is, is considered totally off limits by, uh, by mainstream science. It is considered uh, flaky. It is damaging to one's career. You can, you can lose research grants. You can lose your reputation. And once your reputation is gone in science, obviously everything else starts going down the toilet. Yeah, exactly. Now maybe you can answer this question for me. It was kind of uh, like I'm I'm just a suburban guy. I didn't understand this. The Gormans lost a lot of cattle. Then they moved, uh, but there was still cattle at the Nids Ranch. Did they not move the cattle, or how, how did that work out? Or was this Nids well, provided the, cattle? Well, Nids organization actually purchased a lot of the cattle from the Gormans in order to uh, to set up exactly the same conditions on yeah. the property um, as as had been experienced in the 20 months before we bought it. So. Uh, we actually, the organization actually owned the cattle. Uh, they had been sold by the Gormans to NIDS, and uh, so we installed them essentially to keep the the environment in as close approximation as previously. So when the Gormans moved off, they um, they had other uh, they moved to uh, about 25 miles away from the property. Um, the uh, Tom Gorman, the the uh, the family guy uh, was kept on at NIDS as, as a ranch manager for a few years because he was absolutely outraged at uh, having been thrown out off his property um, by something he had no idea of, of what was constituting the, 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 the force that, that forced him to move off. So he was determined to find out as much as possible. He was looking to NIDS to see if he could find some answers. Yeah. So he, he joined the NIDS organization as, as a ranch manager on the property. So he became a ranch manager on the very same property that he had owned um, in the previous 20 months. And he did it purely to find out some more answers. And, uh, you know, this, this guy was the salt of the earth. He was not sort of given to uh, delusions or sort of uh, fantasies. He was, he was extremely interested in whatever had killed his cattle because, you know, it was a violation of his own privacy. It was a violation of his, of his property rights. And he had no idea of who or what was doing this to him or had done it to him. So he stayed on. The rest of the family moved off uh, to about 25 miles distance. Then a few years later, they moved out of state. And they've been trying to put this whole episode behind them. They don't want to be talked about. Or they don't want to be contacted. Yeah, yeah. Um now, when, when you guys first got to the ranch, he suggested a less is more type attitude in studying. Do you think you guys um, went along with that, or do you, not, do you think you didn't go along with it enough? Or what did you think of that sort of uh, perspective on doing the study of the ranch? Well, we moved onto the property as quickly as possible. Um, we installed a command and control center on the property right beside where the, ra the rancher had been living for the previous 20 months. We brought in a lot of equipment, including recording equipment, um, and we installed people uh, 724 on the property. Um, the, the Gormans, especially Tom Gorman, was was advising us to, and, and, and in hindsight, it, it may have been wise to, to, to take his advice, but we were intent on uh, tracking whatever this thing as, as, as quickly as possible. So his advice was um, take it softly, softly, set up a command and control center, you know, 10 miles away, be on the property as if you were hunting an extremely skittish wild animal was his, the advice he gave us. Yeah. We decided in the interests of time and the interests of, uh, of uh, getting data as quickly as possible to, to move quicker than Tom Gorman was, was advising. But, you know, as, as it turned out, there, were, there was still plenty of activity on the oh, property yeah. um, when we moved on. It was not like everything shut down. But there was a, a difference in flavor to the, 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 the events that happened once we moved on and, uh, you know, the Gormans had moved out. Now, were you, 
did you ever live like on the ranch? I know uh, you guys sometimes they would spend time there. Did you actually spend time there and live there, or was it earlier in the book you referenced being flown from Vegas to the ranch uh, when that first calf gets gets? Yeah, slain? well, beginning in uh, in 1996, in in September of 1996, uh, we. We would be on the ranch. We would live on the ranch for five, seven days, and then we would uh, we would come back to Vegas for a couple of days. Then we would go back to the ranch for five, seven days. So uh, we were living most of the time on the ranch for the first year, year and a half, um, with the exception being uh, once the the temperature plunged down below zero up in northeastern Utah. Oh yeah. Uh, we came back to Vegas. Uh, we were in constant daily conversations with uh, Tom Gorman. And he would report anything unusual. We would make the decision to fly up there or, or not. Uh, we did have a private jet at our disposal, which is an unusual uh, facility for a research team. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, in March of 1997, um, we were actually on the point of, of going up there anyway when we got the call that a, uh, a an 84-pound calf had been dismembered in broad daylight on the property. So... We we got on the private jet. We moved up to uh, to Utah. We were standing over the animal within um, literally four to five hours of the phone call, and uh, the animal was lying on the grass with uh, with its both its its all four legs spread eagled on the grass. Um, all of the internal organs were gone. The the ribs had been cut open, and uh, everything was with the the entire body cavity was empty. Um, there was not a drop of blood on the animal or underneath the animal. And um, this had all happened a few hours previously when uh, Tom Gorman and his wife were tagging these new, new uh, newly born calves. Uh, they had just tagged this particular animal, moved down the property about 300 yards to tag another animal when um, they noticed that the dog that was with them uh, was began behaving kind of strangely. Yeah. Um, so they went back uh, to investigate the source of, of the, the, the dog's discomfort, and they found this calf they had just tagged 45 minutes earlier. And remember, this is like 11 o'clock in the morning. This was a bright, sunny day. Everything looked peaceful, except for the fact that this calf that they had tagged previously had com been completely dismembered um, in broad daylight with no sound. Um, these two people were only 300 yards away. Both had excellent hearing. Both had excellent eyesight. They didn't see or hear a thing. So um, we had a veterinarian as part of the research team um, who instantly started conducting a necropsy on the uh, on the dead calf. First thing he noticed was that the uh, the ear which had carried this this new ear tag had been sliced off to the skull, and um, his initial impressions was a sharp instrument had been used. But he took samples anyway. He sent those samples to three, two, three different independent uh, veterinary pathology labs, who confirmed his initial observation that sharp instruments had been used on this ear. There was also one of the femur bones had been forcibly ripped out of the animal, oh. and was lying on the grass about 10 feet away from the animal when we discovered it. We packaged this bone off, uh, sent it to one of the top forensic laboratories in the country. Um, who came back then later saying that uh, two separate different sharp instruments had been used on this bone, one a heavy machete instrument and the other like a light, like tweezers, scissors yeah. kind of instrument. So there was, there was strong evidence that this animal certainly had been killed in association with sharp instruments. Um, the cause of death was not immediately known except the animal had been totally dismembered. Um, and the, the fact that there was not a single drop of blood on the on the animal or underneath the animal was really spooky to look at because this animal should have had between two and three liters of blood. Oh, yeah. If you slash an animal's throat, you know, there's blood everywhere, you know, when you're, when you're killing them. And to have this done completely silently in the presence of a couple of, of very alert people 300 yards away is even more spooky. So... Uh, we got the services of a of a professional tracker um, on the spot to start looking for tracks. He spent the next several days quartering the property um, within a quarter to half a mile radius of this dead animal and found pretty well no tracks, no evidence whatsoever. And this guy made, makes a living from tracking, so it's yeah. not like this was the first time he was doing this, and there was no tracks whatsoever. So. Whatever happened in terms of this 84-pound calf um, 
was a pretty unique method of killing. It, it showed signs of tremendous force. In other words, it does take a lot of force to rip the femur away from the ball and socket joint, tear all the ligaments from the femur of even a, a newborn calf, and uh, lay it on the grass. And the way the animal had been laid on the grass also was very unusual. That It was obviously placed there, um, carefully placed there. It was not thrown there in a heap of, uh, of bones and flesh. It was carefully placed there with all four legs spreading to, you know, different points of the campus. It was it was obviously very carefully done, whatever that operation or whoever did did that operation. So, the forensic analysis definitely tied it to sharp on, uh, sharp instruments. So there was this was not a predator attack. It was it was a very skillful operation carried out by people who were uh, fairly well acquainted with surgery. Now, one thing that stood out for me when I was reading the book uh, was sort of on um, the theme of digging, because uh, when the Gormans first bought the ranch in the property in the sale, it was that they couldn't dig without prior permission or something like that. Yeah. And then later you say uh, you guys consulted some remote viewers, and they said there was something under the ground. And then later you said you guys dug into uh, the ground at some point, and it seemed to cause more uh, seemed to cause some UFOs to come around. Did you? How extensive did you guys investigate that aspect of the ranch? Well, we actually imported a uh, a, a big caterpillar um, digger up onto the property. Yeah. Um, and and we used that to periodically dig these large trenches on the property because. The Gorman family had told us a series of anecdotes when they started um, changing the overall topography that they, they found that, that it seemed to be a signal for an increase in intensity of this activity. So we decided to see if we could stimulate the, the activity yeah. because yeah. It, was, it was very, very difficult to capture anything um, on the fly, so to speak, because we never knew when or where anything would erupt or what kind of incidents would happen. So yeah. We decided to try to be more proactive, so we started digging on the property, um, large 50-yard uh, long trenches, this kind of thing, alter the, the topography. And in several cases, within, say, 72, 96 hours, neighbors would begin reporting increases in activity. Uh, we never actually captured the activity, the so-called, quote-unquote, response to digging on the property, but we did find that it, it did seem to elicit some kind of a reaction, albeit a, a delayed reaction, but we were never able to capture the evidence of that reaction on the, you know, in a way that, that the science advisory board yeah. uh, found acceptable. Yeah. Now, uh, during all this time, you guys were at the ranch because of the original publicity for the Gormans. It became uh, quite a hotbed of rumors in the esoteric world. What did you think about that at the time? And, and were you hearing from uh, people in, you know, ufology and cryptozoology and various fields trying to get information on what was going on there? Yeah, we we were getting uh, we were getting, I'd say, weekly to mon monthly communications from all of the above people who wanted to get on the property, people who had heard about uh, what the Gorman family had been through. They had heard about NIDS uh, purchasing the property because that made the, the media also. Yeah. That there, was, there was a couple of newspaper stories about it. Uh, so it became notorious very quickly, and we decided to try to professionalize this, uh, this investigation by um, basically clamping down on publicity and, and try to set this this area up as a laboratory, the paranormal, yeah. install equipment, install personnel, and do scientific research without being disturbed by, uh, by you know, people who are trying to encroach on the property, people who are trying to get on the property for whatever reason. So the idea was that if and when anything materialized in terms of scientific validity from this uh, investigation on the property, then we would be, we'd be in a position to publish it, we'd be in, in a position to talk about it. But before that, um, we were we had no intention of, uh, of publicizing what we were doing, yeah. and um, that's in our view still a legitimate way to conduct science. Um, oh, yeah. Science by press conference is always a bad idea, and this of course led to a whole slew of rumors in the uh, in the esoteric fields that you know we were covering up evidence that we were in contact with aliens that we were you know trying yeah. to. Uh, 
you know, invite the CIA onto the property, this kind of thing. So it was there was multiple different uh, consp conspiracy scenarios spun out of the fact that we were not willing to go on the record about the kind of research we were doing. And the reason we weren't willing to go on the record was because we were trying to conduct a legitimate scientific investigation, and the idea is to gather the the, uh, the data before you actually start talking about it. Yeah. Yes. Did you have a lot of incidents with people trying to break into the ranch, or was it pretty like uh, after a while, like people knew not to bother with like Area 51 type situation? Well, we, yeah, we we had uh, we had constant surveillance of the property per perimeters, and actually that that surveillance continues to this day. So it was uh, it's it's it was always monitored. There were people always there. And there still are. So, I mean, it, it, it was difficult for people to encroach on the property, even though some people did try. Yeah. There was, uh, there was, it, it, it became pretty um, obvious during the um, during the tenure of NIDS on the on the property that there were, you know, police would be called, poli and 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 any trespassers would be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. So. There was an active discouragement of uh, people getting on the property, and it was pretty successful. We, after the first um, spate of uh, media publicity died down, there were very few incursions. Well, that's good. Now, um, now I know Nid sort of has stepped down uh, on the ranch investigation, but you also, you guys did the Black Triangle UFO study, and you did sort of like a sister investigation in Dolce. Uh, what other sort of uh, studies have you guys done that you can talk about, uh, or anything like that? Um, we've looked we've looked in a diff several different areas around the country. Primarily, as you mentioned, Dulce, New Mexico, and also uh, northeastern Utah. But we've we've done a fair number of studies down the, around in the Buckeye area in Arizona, yep. where there's been a lot of uh, a lot of reported sightings. Where the, you know the famous Phoenix Triangle was associated with that area or, or and and we we've we've gone to targeted areas in California on, on occasion to investigate uh, alleged uh, alleged incursions and also um, we've actually gone out east on the on the odd occasion too but primarily our focus has been in the southwest of the country yeah and what uh, you... we, we we have investigated uh you know we 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 actually sent people out to uh to illinois during the uh the famous uh january two thousand uh black triangle incident uh, okay, yeah. that flew over scott air force base so nids nids was pretty active around the country in investigating targeted sightings that were considered um you know considered worthy of investigation, but in general, the, the vast majority of the time, especially during the years 1996 through 2000, were spent either in uh, northern New Mexico or in northern northeastern Utah. Now, what made you guys decide to uh, do sort of like a separate study on the Black Triangle uh, UFOs? Well, it, it basically fell across the, uh, the desk, and w once we had published the results of the uh, of the Illinois sighting, it became sort of commonplace for people to start reporting uh, sightings of these mysterious black triangles on uh, to our website and we got hundreds and hundreds of reports so it was uh, it was not by design that we jumped into the black triangle thing and people started contacting us people started reporting these incidents yeah we actually opened a hotline and we got we got, you know, literally hundreds of, of different oh, wow. uh, incidents from around the country, and we we interviewed all of the people involved. In some cases, you know, um, 17 to 20 eyewitnesses. For example, there was another famous one in Carteret, New Jersey, in uh, 2001 that we investigated. We we uh, interviewed about 20 separate eyewitnesses, and we triangulated the, uh, you know, the, uh, the the sighting, but. In general, I think the uh, the so-called Skinwalker Ranch became what was and continued to be a pretty unique um, area where the, a laboratory of these unusual incidents could be set up and uh, and studied very very closely because that's one of the that's one of the holy grails really in in this kind of research is to is to really focus as deeply as possible and um, and gather as, as, as many data as possible on as many incidents as possible, and that's what we did in Utah, and 
the the results that came out of it as we published in this book was a bewildering variety of different incidents yeah that spanned all across the field of cryptozoology paranormal ghost hunting um ufology all of these phenomena have been divided neatly into into different categories and uh what was really astounding about the uh the utah the Utah experience was that these boundaries seem to be totally irrelevant to what what was unfolding on the property in Utah. It it, it was one moment it was cryptozoology, the next moment, moment it was these weird flying objects, including these uh, large black triangles. The next moment it would be silver discs or Mexican hat-shaped UFOs, and next minute would be cattle mutilation. So it seemed to be a Grand Central Station where multiple um, incidents erupted, and uh, as as we mentioned in the book, there has been a tr traditional sort of separation between these d disciplines. Cryptozoologists yes, yes. don't usually study uh, UFOs, and nuts and bolts Uf ufologists don't usually study Bigfoot. And uh, you know, ghost hunters tend to keep their distance, and uh, people who enter who who are into discarnate voices and hauntings and poltergeist activity tend to view the whole UFO subject with disdain. And so there's there's these multiple camps in, in, in these esoteric areas that are completely separate. But the Utah Ranch, this the so called Skinwalker Ranch had the effect of uniting all of these and we were in a position of having either to throw out the data or else include all of the data, and we we were determined to keep an open mind on this whole uh, project and and to recount, to uh, to document all of these incidents as closely as possible, and not throw anything out because they didn't fit into a particular pigeonhole, you know, just because in exactly the same pro uh, area of the property a flying object had been witnessed uh, a week before, where um, this week there was a, a dead cow that had obviously been sliced up. Um, was there a connection between these two incidents? We have no way of knowing, but there was certainly a geographical connection in that they they had happened uh, right on the same spot in the, in, in the same area of the property. Uh, we still have no idea of uh, whether or not there was a, a temporal or a, uh, a cause and effect connection between these kinds of disparate incidents, or was there was it some kind of a, an attractor, sort of a geographical attractor, for whatever reason? This this particular property was attracting uh, all this weird stuff. I should also mention that um, this ranch is located in an area of northeastern Utah that has had at least a 50-year history, possibly even longer, of a whole variety of uh, bizarre flying object incidents, UFO incidents going back to about 1950, 1951. The reason we know that is that um, way back at that time, um, the, the local science teacher at, in, in, the, in the local high school began to collect um, the, the reports that were coming in from the local population, and he was uh, he he had sufficient credibility in the in the local community that he was able to collect these incidents and keep confidentiality. So he accumulated over the years hundreds and hundreds of high quality reports. And the ranch is located exactly in the in the center of that whole area that had been subject to all this weird activity since the uh, early 1950s. Now, whether or not the the incidents that were happening on the ranch were a good snapshot of the incidents that were happening elsewhere, we don't know because we know that this retired school teacher um, had collected so many different incidents over time that he began to skew the collection method towards only the most spectacular sightings of flying objects because his his feeling was he could spend all day every day interviewing people regarding all of the different weird things that had happened to them in this in this area of Utah he decided to uh, to skew his uh, his his investigation only towards the most spectacular yeah. multiple incident sightings of UFOs so a lot of the stuff that uh, that that had happened on the property had also happened in in different areas of Utah, but it just simply were not reported. Now, like you just spoke to the sociological aspects of the different um, 
sects of research in esoterica, and that sort of speaks to uh, the one, the only real skeptical argument I've heard from anyone is, is that they sort of just shut down when they um, getting involved on the ranch. My first trip to the ranch was in September '96, so oh wow, um, it was very fast actually. Okay, and yeah, let me uh, just do a little background here on the book because the book is about. The ranch, the infamous Nids Ranch, uh, that many in Esoterica have heard about and talked about for so long, and finally the book has come out. Uh, it's one of the most talked about books of the holiday season, and now uh, everybody, I hope, has either picked it up and read it, or is going out and getting it after this interview, or they're going to shut off the interview and buy it and read it and then listen to the interview. But it's definitely, you got to check out this book. It was awesome. I loved it. And it's about this ranch. First, this family moves there. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff happens, giant wolves, uh, UFOs, Bigfoot-type sighting things, just uh, poltergeist-type activity, crazy stuff. They eventually can't take any more. They move out. The NIDS, uh, the National Institute for Discovery Science, buys the ranch, and they install uh, these fine folks, these scientists of whom Colm was one of. Is that pretty much the, the gist of the story? Yeah, that's that's correct. Uh, the family, I think, we're, we're at the stage of mental and physical exhaustion um, by the summer of 1996. And uh, so they started reaching out for help, and um, word got out um, into the media, and uh, we heard about it in uh, July or so of 1996. Now, at this stage, the family had been on the property for about 20 months, which is a very short time, but during that period, um, out of a herd of 80 cattle, which was their livelihood, they, they bred uh, high-end cattle, like yeah. black simmentals, black angus. Out of a herd of 80 cattle, they had either lost, disappeared, or, or had been killed 14 animals. So oh, man. No, a normal attrition rate for this kind of an operation was one animal per year. But uh, 14 animals had disappeared or, or been killed in 20 months, and they were they were essentially economically bankrupt. At the same time, they had been exposed to almost daily or weekly um, extremely stressful events that they could not explain. This was a salt of the earth family who were were basically looking to set up a, a ranching operation in a quiet area of northeastern Utah, and they they just wanted to get about their business, but they were constantly the siege by phenomena they could not explain um, to the extent that they lost sleep. The kids uh, in school, um, their grades fell from straight A students all the way down to D's and uh, Las Vegas. So he hired a bunch of professional scientists as well as uh, a science advisory board which had a lot of uh, expertise in different topics including physics, chemistry, biology, there were medical people on board, there was psychology people, computer science experts and forensics, and all of these oh, wow. people were mainstream scientists who worked in government labs and academia. So National Institute for Discovery Science had both full-time scientists on its staff as well as a very um, well-qualified science advisory board. So. It was not the kind of usual investigation of paranormal phenomena that people talk about. In other words, people are doing it on their own time on weekends or, or you know, during the evenings kind yeah. of thing. So, it, you know, from that perspective, I think the, the NIDF was a very unique organization. Now, how long were you working for NIDS before they uh, picked up the Gorman Ranch? Uh, it was very quick, actually, because... Um, the Gorman Ranch began to sort of filter out into the into the media in summer of '96. I joined in uh, August of '96, so there was a very short period um, between joining and actually the origin and evolution of consciousness in the universe. Now, how often do you see an ad like that in science magazines? So obviously, I was intrigued enough to uh, answer the ad. At the same time. As an immunologist, um, I've always been interested in the effects on the immune system of altered states and uh, different different stress levels on the immune system as well as uh, as physiology in general. So, when uh, when I heard about this this uh, new organization called the National Institute for Discovery Science, um, obviously I applied and uh, I was successful. So I moved from Denver to Las Vegas in uh, 1996 to begin working as a research manager at the National Institute for Discovery Science. And it is it, it was a very, very unusual organization in that it was specifically formed in order to 
study the quote-unquote uh, paranormal or anomalies, which included UFO sightings, uh, cattle mutilations, and, and, you know, the usual cast of characters in, in paranormal phenomena. And what was different about NIS was that it was fully funded by uh, Robert Bigelow, who was the CEO of an aerospace company and also a real estate entrepreneur. This interview was conducted on January 21st, 2006. Colm Kelleher on Banal of America Audio. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to another edition of Banal of America Audio. My guest this week is Colm Kelleher. He is the co-author of Hunt for the Skinwalker about the Nids Ranch in Utah, and he was the project manager and team leader at a private research institute at uh, National Institute of Discovery Sciences, which is Nids. And uh, he's also well known in esoteric circles for his mad cow and CJD research and the book Brain Trust. And he has a PhD in biochemistry, and he is the guest this week on Been All of America Audio. Welcome to the show, Colm. Great to be here, Tim. Uh, why don't you just give me a little brief bio on how uh, you how you ended up at NIDS? Well, my background, as you mentioned, is in biochemistry. I was working in uh, a institute in immunology in Denver, Colorado, in 1996 when I saw what I thought was a very interesting ad for research managers in a new institute um, that was published in Science Magazine, which is the prim one of the premier uh, science journals. And the ad was specifically looking for people who were willing to research